Okay, great. Whenever people want to wander back this way, we'll get started. Um, I'm probably going to use most of the time. So, uh, oh, anyways, I'll, I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is Lisa Nygut. Um The title of this workshop is Observability in Time, or a Brief Exploration of the Foundational Selection Mechanics of Quantum Reality. Um, so the goal of this session is going to be to introduce you to the basic mechanics of our shared reality um, from a quantum perspective. Um, the material that I'm covering today is rooted in insights from two books. Um, one is by David Deutsch called The Fabric of Reality. Uh, the other is Richard Feynman's QED or Quantum Electrodynamics. Um, so before I get started, could I just see by a quick show of hands how many, oh wait, I am not flipping, okay, cool, sorry. Um, these are the books. Um, could I see just by a quick show of hands how many of you before today have heard of David Deutsch? Okay, that's a lot of people. Um, what about Richard Feynman? That's everybody. Okay, now how many of you have read The Fabric of Reality? Yes, okay, great. There's three people back that way, great, okay. Um, so thank you, thank you very much. That was very useful. Um, so everyone should have gotten some note cards, a pen and an envelope. One of these, and if you didn't get one, there's a couple up here at front if you wanna come, but I think everyone got one, okay, cool. Um, great, okay, so I think everybody's got all the things, we can get started. Um, so the goals for the session today, um, one is to give you a short introduction to quantum physics. Um, and then uh, and after that, to um, talk a little bit about what these quantum physics tells us about the nature of reality. Um, so in order to accomplish these goals, I have a strategy. Uh, the first part of that strategy is to explain how the universe we exist in is actually a multiverse. So first we're gonna prove multiverse. Um, the next part of my strategy is going to be to talk to you about how universe selection works. Um, because if there's a bunch of universes that we could end up in, AKA a multiverse, um, how and why do we end up in this one? Great, okay, um, cool. So uh, task one, so the first task is to explain the multiverse. Um, so this is an ad admittedly lightly interactive workshop. Uh, your first task uh, is to convince yourself that reality is actually a multiverse. Um, great, okay, um, right. So you all have a notepad and a piece of paper uh, and, and a pen. So please write down the proof that you would want to see onto one of these note cards of what proof you would need in order to convince yourself that we live in a multiverse. And I, I'll give you a minute and a half to do this. Oh, someone asked the question, what is a multiverse? Um, a multiverse is in a uh, collection of universes. Um, wow, that's a great question. <laughs> I don't think about that one. Um, hmm. <laughs> what, yeah. Someone wants to see a definition of a multiverse in order to convince themselves that they live in one. So I think that's, I think that's a good thing to put on the card. Um. Okay, that's been a minute and a half. Um, does anyone want to share, so we get one or two people who, what c evidence they would want? This guy in the back wants to give me his. 
Okay, existence of a being who is from another universe. Okay, does anyone else have? Yes. Okay, Joseph wants to actually visit another another universe. Um, okay. Okay. Right. So you want to know if there's logically other possible universes. What's logically? Okay. Chris wants to know what's logically possible. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and walk you through. Um, Um, so now let me go ahead and walk you through the proof that David Deutsch gives us in the fabric of reality. Um, but um, before I get into his proof, I just want to kind of walk very quickly through how does a proof work. Um, scientific proofs involve setting up an experiment, um, then measuring, or running the experiment, then measuring, observing what happens in the experiment. Um, cool. Okay. So basically, we get our understanding of reality, at least in the scientific sense, from what observations that we make. Great. Um, OK, so Deutsch's proof of the multiverse relies on a fairly well-known experiment, um, which is called the double slit experiment. Um, so in order to properly explain it, however, um, first we need to take a small detour into what the exact nature of light is. Um, so in particular, the question that we kind of want to know the answer to is light continuous or is it a discrete quantity? Um, and in case you're not entirely sure what those mean, here's a picture, a line that like doesn't have any breaks in it, that's continuous quantity, and then discrete means that basically it's like, um, it's like stepwise function. So there's, there's like steps, it's not smooth. Okay. Um, okay, so one way to try and find this out is by taking a light and trying and moving away from it. Um, so as humans, as we move away from light, it gets dimmer and dimmer, and then eventually we can't see it anymore. Um, so from our human experience, it would appear that light is continuous um, because human eyes aren't sensitive enough, enough to see anything that's not continuous. Um, okay, great, but if you take a frog, um, on the other hand, and David Deutsch tells us that frogs can see individual light beams, um, and I, I happen to believe him, um, so what happens is a frog moves farther and farther away from a light source. Um, at some point, the light is going to start to flicker. So it'll go from being like a, a solid light until then he'll see um, kind of like a flicker. And the flicker, as the light moves away, will get farther and farther apart. Um, and that's because light at its smallest like, unit you can get is actually not continuous. It is actually discrete. Um, in fact, like this discreteness is where the term quantum comes from. Uh, quantum mechanics is a movement away from this classical understanding of physics, where everything is continuous, um, which is like how we experience light, to a quantized or discrete understanding of how individual particles move. Um, so in other words, quantum mechanics is a discussion and understanding of matter at a discrete level where particles become individualized. Okay, cool. So to summarize, we have established that light is a particle. If you spread it out far enough, it thins down to individual discrete quanta of light. Cool. Okay, so light's a particle. Great. So let's get into the double slit experiment. Um, so this is a fairly classic quantum physics experiment. Um, uh, where are we? Sorry. Whee. Um, okay, so here's a setup. Um, we're going to take some light and we're going to shine it through two slits and a piece of metal. Um, hence the name double slit. Uh, if we were shining a flashlight through the holes, um, what would we expect to see on the screen? Let's see. Uh, we would expect to see light in two vertical slits that match the slits in the metal. Um, so that's if we have like a flashlight. What would we expect to see, however, if we take, instead of taking a flashlight, we take a single photon and we send it through the slits? Um, so if you let's take a second and maybe like draw what you think you would see if we take a single photon of light and we send it through um, two slits and a piece of metal, what would we expect to show up on the screen?
Cool, okay. Um, so this is like pretty much impossible to guess if you don't know what it is, um, because most scientists, when they found out, were like incredibly flabbergasted. But um, so what I would expect is to get something like this, which is light passing through the slit on the right, or this, which is um, a photon passing through the slit on the left, or maybe do a dot because it's a photon and not a beam of light. Anyways, you'd expect the light to come out in one of these two places, right? Which is to say on the back side of the slit. But what happens in reality? Um, oh, this is another view of the experiment. This is what we would expect to see. We've got particles coming through and then they end up on the screen behind the thing. But this is, this is not what happens. Um, what we actually observe uh, behind the screen is this. Um, we see this bar-like pattern of light. Um, and notice that this is like, they send one photon at a time and like aggregate the results. This is what you get. So this is not, like if you send a single photon, it's not gonna hit all these places. It's only gonna hit one of them. But um, this is what it looks like. Um, so here's a more detailed photo, kind of what it looks like. So again, we're sending a single photon through the, through the slit at a time, um, and it ends up in what, not where we thought it would, but in one of these other places. So why does this happen? Um, so one explanation that you might hear is that, well, light is wave-like. Um, and so it's going out in waves, and these waves interfere with each other. Um, and because it's interfering like a wave, it gets this like interference pattern, which is true. We definitely see an interference pattern. Um, but we can reject this idea of wave likeness because of what we know about how frogs see light, um, in that it arrives in like a particle. We know that it's a single particle that we're sending through. Um, so there's only one single particle of light that's gone through the slits. So what then is going to explain? this wave-like pattern, something is interfering with the way that light is moving through space and hitting the screen behind the slits, uh, but what? So Deutsch tells us that the interference is coming from that exact same photon particle itself. Um, but how can that be? There is only one particle. Uh, it's not, so the particle is interacting with all of the potential pathways that it might possibly take um, throughout all of the well, all the possible ways that that particle could arrive to hit the screen, um, it interacts across basically, each of those possibilities then becomes a separate universe. Um, so that would basically be the multiverse. So what we end up seeing and experiencing in this universe is the net result of all of those potential universes that happen at the same time. Um, so the movement of a particle through space is interacting with its potential pathways, I already said that, and we can see, we can see the result, like you can see it, it shows up. That's the bar-like pattern of light that we see is because this photon, as it has moved through space, has interacted and canceled out the pathways of all the other possible places that it might have ended up um, across all the other universes that actually do happen, um, and you end up seeing a, a, a barred result. Um, yeah, so that is the conclusion basically that Deutsch reaches is that this is the net of all possible universes is what we end up seeing. Cool, okay. Um, so I'd like you to take a moment now and revisit what you wrote about evidence that would be required to convince you that we exist in a multiverse. Um, did this evidence help you convince yourself? Okay, how many people are convinced? I'm just like curious now, I'm gonna show hands. I got like three hands, there's like four, okay, four people now, fine, just, all right, great, cool. Um, oh, nice, that's not my thing, uh, cool. Um, okay, so I'd like to give you one further example about how this net of all possibilities affects reality um, that I found interesting for Feynman's book, QED. So Feynman's goal with QED is quite different from Deutsch. Deutsch wants to explain the universe Feynman is merely attempting to explain how physics at a quantum level works. So like Deutsch, he's using experiments with light to illustrate his point, um, except his experiment's a little different. So he's using his experiment that he's using, um, he's gonna calculate how much light will be reflected off of a pane of glass. So um, yeah, what Feynman demonstrates in this example is how in order to calculate the result of where light will end up, you have to sum up all the possibilities of how the light might move. Um, so basically this is like the same as the double slit experiment, except it's um, just using like a basically a different setup. Um, so in optics, when you bounce light off of a semi-reflective surface, such as a body of water or a pane of glass, 
There's a straightforward mathematical formula which you can use um, to calculate how much light will be refracted off the surface of the water at a particular angle. Um, so in this formula, it requires you to know the refractive index of the material you're bouncing off of, um, the angle that your sensor is placed at in relation to the light source, so the angle of A. Um, it's an accurate formula. It gives the correct answer is how much light will be reflected off the surface. Um, but this formula is a shortcut. It's used by classical physicists. Um, so Feynman was a quantum physicist. He wanted to understand the um, actual, how, like, how does this like, actually happen on a particle level because now we can see them. Um, so in reality, the light is not just bouncing off the top and being reflected to A. Um, you have to take into, in order to figure out how the light will move, you have to take into account all of the possible paths that that light might take in order to reach either um, the sensor A, which is the reflective, like light that's been reflected off the surface, or they'll reach B, which is to say is passed through the glass. Um, so in the process of calculating these paths, um, you need to calculate, oh, how much light, what's the possibility the light will bounce off the top layer? Um, what's the possibility that the light will bounce off the bottom layer, um, reach back up to the top layer, bounce off the top layer again, and then finally exit to end up at B. So there's a lot of possibilities of how photons of light will interact with particles of glass as they pass by them. Um, and it's, in fact, it's, it's not just the top and the bottom of the glass that we need to account for, it's every layer of particles in the glass that have the potential to interact with light as it passes through it. Um, so basically, you have to sum up all of the possibilities um, for how the light might or might not interact with the particles of glass at every layer that you have particles. Um, and if you take all of these possibilities and you add them up and you sum them, um, you end up with the exact same result that you get from using the formula that we started with. Um, so that makes it like this generalized assumption about light reflecting off the top surface of the pane of glass. Um, so what, note that like what we're not adding up isn't exactly like how the light moves. We're not like, oh, this is how the light moves through the glass. Um, what we're adding up is a probability of it moving that particular way. Um, and what we see and what we experience is the net result of that probability set, if that makes sense. Um, cool. Uh, I had like this aside um, about how like the technical term for that light path probability in physics is called the amplitude. Um, it's called the amplitude because there's this very mistaken impression that light is a wave, but that's not important. I just think it's fun to trash on the light. Um, interpretation. Uh, so I've glossed over some of the details here, but this general idea is correct. Um, what we're able to observe is the net sum of what might have happened and does happen in some possible universe. So there's all these other universes out there that interact with ours, um, and as we saw in the double split experiment, that dictates what is observable in our particular universe. Um, and we see it in the sum of the possibilities. So our lived universe is one version of what's possible. Um, okay, so we, we do live in the multiverse. Uh, we can see these other universes as interference when we do quantum experiments. Um, so what does this living in a multiverse tell us about the nature of existence in a universe, singular? Um, okay, so, well, we know that everything that is physically possible happens in the set. So if the set, so like the circles, like all the possible universes that could happen, um, we know that it's bound to only the ones that are physically possible. Um, and we know that we might experience a subset of that. Um, cool. So, and we know that what we actually, so we might experience a subset of everything that's physically possible. We know that we do experience is an actual tiny fraction of that set. So we can calculate what all the probabilities are and say, hey, this is what all of the universes might look like and we will end up in one of them. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit more about our universe experience, but first let's like dial it back to the nature of the broady, broader multiverse system, the set of all possible universes that we might exist in. Um, okay, so we, one thing that we know is a certainty in every universe um, are kind of things that we consider in physics to be universal constants. So an example of this is the speed of light. Um, we call this C. Like, so C is the speed of light. Now Feynman mentions in QED that light can travel faster than C. Um, but none of what we experience or the calculations that we do in physics involve light traveling faster than C. 
Um, so that puts C, like light that travels faster than C, outside of all of the possible universes that we can experience. It's not in like our multiverse set. Doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, but it's not going to ever happen in any universe that we would ever end up in. So since it's not a possibility that we don't have to worry about, we don't have to consider it in our physics equations. It's not a constant for our multiverse set. Cool, so our universal set contains constants. One of them is that light travels at C. Um, cool, so it's, it's worth noticing, I think it's interesting that this task of discovering what is constant between the universes um, is a problem that is generally relegated to the realm of physicists. Um, so that's their goal is to discover these universal constants. Um, cool, so I'd like to propose that there are two um, universe possibility mechanisms that are also universal across universes, um, and that is observation and time. Cool. Um, okay, so I'd like to talk about each of these a little bit more in detail. Um, I was gonna roll a dice to figure out which one we would talk about, so we could have like the universes diverge, but I don't actually know what the slide, well, let's see what, okay, that'd be fine. I'm sorry, I forgot to read my notes. Okay, so an odd dice is observation and tails will give us time. Okay. okay, so that's a three, so odd is observation, which hopefully is the next slide. No, that's fine, okay, let me find it, hang on. Oh no, I have to do it in two places, sorry. Okay, um, where are we? Okay, great, cool. Okay, observation. So there's observations, actually there's a couple parts here that we need to cover. Um, I'll try and go through it quickly. Um, cool, so first, some aspects of reality are unobserved. So there's two things that I think I wanna like illustrate through observation and um, kind of get you to understand about um, how observation works in the multiverse set. Um, first, some aspects of reality are unobservable, and second, observation has the power to change what's possible in this universe. Um, it can limit it and it can also expand it. Cool, so first, uh, what is observation? So um, you'll notice I've, I mentioned this a few times already. Um, we have, maybe I said observable or measurable. Um, we can observe light reflecting off a pane of glass. We can observe what light passes through a slit and arrives on a screen. Um, we can construct experiments that allow us to observe the speed of light. Um, in fact, like observation is the root of the enlightened era of science and discovery. What we know of as science is based on our ability to conjecture, construct experiments, and observe or measure what happens. I'm totally, okay, so right, so observation is based on this is science. Um, so what are the steps of doing science? We went through these earlier. We set up an experiment, you run the experiment, you observe and you measure the experiment. Um, at some point, we added in the last like 150 years, we added this um, new thing to doing science, which is that we repeat the experiment and then do statistics about the results of the experiment. Um, I like to think this is because we do live in a multiverse where things are, pos there's a lot of possibilities and so, Requiring repeatability helps us gain confidence that the result is generalizable across the varying set of universes. How do you know that it's generalizable across universes if you don't figure out what the probability set is? Anyway, um, the process of measuring the result worked all well and good. Um, so observation worked as, as we see it and expect it to until we reached a quantum level. And there, physicists ran into this observational roadblock. Um, they actually gave it a name called the Heisenberg's Uncertainty Principle. Um, so in general idea, when you're doing quantum, doing any kind of observation, right, or especially like about particles, um, you've got this particle that you want to observe, you run an experiment on it. Um, so one thing you would like to know about a particle is the speed and direction that it's traveling. Um, another thing that you would like to know about the particle is its current location. 
um, being reasonable, right? Um, however, the physicists that were doing um, experiments on this stuff discovered that it is physically impossible to know both the location of a particle and its speed and direction at the same time. Um, so you can know where a particle is, but you'll have no idea where it will be next. Um, or you can know how fast it is traveling, but you will have no idea where it currently is. Um, this is huge. This is really unsettling. Imagine being a scientist in this era when science was the art of observing the things. Uh, we believe that we could know everything that there is and was to know, um, only if we could observe it. So if we build better tools for observing all of the things and we look at smaller and smaller particles, um, we eventually we will know how the whole world works because we can see it. Um, however, we got to the point where we got to these particles that were tiny and we realized that we cannot actually observe all of the things. This changed science. This changed what we can know about the universe. Um, because there are aspects of reality that are physically impossible for us to know or to observe, at least simultaneously. Cool. Um, okay, so there are things about the universe that we cannot observe. Uh, that's kind of a big deal. Um, so there's a classification here that we can make with regards to observability that I think is worthwhile. And in fact, is one that Deutsch makes as well. It's about the knowability of our current state in the universe. So um, here we can run a quick example. I'm going to roll some dice. Yeah, there we go. Can you like reach it? You can't do that. Okay, cool. So I'm going to roll some dice. Okay, I'm going to roll dice. Okay, so I have rolled the dice. I've covered it up so you can't see it. Um, but I'd like for you to take a guess of one of which six, so there's six possible universes that we ended up in. Well, equally likely. Um, I want you to write down which one you think we are currently in. How many of you guessed correctly? How many guessed that we're in the three universe? I would expect one six of you. That's about one six. That's cool. Okay. Because, um, you know, probabilities, that's how that works. Um. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So when the dice were covered up, they were knowable but unobserved. Um, because aft so after they had been rolled, we, the universe set of what was possible before I rolled it was like, it could be any of the six. But I asked you the question after I had already rolled it. So we already existed in the universe where the answer was knowable. All we needed to do was to observe it, which we did. Um, so an example of an unknowable thing would be the movement and location of a subatomic particle precisely the particle that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle deals with, um, so that information is literally unknowable. So we can take information and we can kind of divide them into these like two things, like uh, maybe it's knowable and already observed, it's knowable but not yet observed, um, versus things that are literally unknowable. Uh, cool. Um, okay, so before we leave observation entirely, um, I'd like to give you an idea of just how powerful observation is in terms of determining which universe of all possible that we end up experiencing. Um, so we can actually see this in the dual ex slit experiment that we saw earlier. Um, so first we need to make a modification to it. We're going to place sensors at each of the two slits. Um, so now, every time that a photon moves past the sensor, it's gonna make a click. Uh, and this click is going to allow us to observe a photon moving through the slit. So. Um, now, the pattern that we observe on the screen, where the photon appears, turns out to be exactly what you would expect. Um, so the interference that we saw earlier completely disappears. Um, so why is this? Does anyone want to take a guess? Yes, exactly. Because observation limits what's possible. Once the possibility is removed, you no longer have the interference from the other possible universes. You have, in a sense, limited what is possible in this universe by adding observation to it. It's kind of cool. 
kind of tricky, okay. Um, so to reiterate, observation is one way that we can change what the possible set of universes is available to us, um, which really puts those government sunshine laws into perspective, huh? Um, okay, that's a bad joke. Um, okay, wait, so <laughs> we're not there yet. Okay, so now let's go back and look at time. Um, thank you for the question. Okay, cool. Um, time. Okay, so let's go back and talk a little bit more about this constant C, the speed of light. Uh, what is C exactly? Um, so it expresses, it expresses the rate of movement of a photon of light. That is, it tells us how much time will pass as light moves through space. Um, cool. So in some sense, time is a boundary or a limit to how far that move that light can move. Um, kind of like how a pawn's moves are limited on a chessboard for every turn, a time bounds what's possible in the next moment. Um, so in a broader sense, time bounds not just light, but anything of what's uh, possible to occur in this universe, or any possible universe that is reachable from our current one. Um, so again, time's just this boundary, it dictates what's possible. Um, but what does time tell us about universe selection? Um, so as it's impossible for light to travel faster than C, any universe where a human on the moon, say, finds out about something on Earth faster than the speed of light can travel, that is not a possible universe that we will end up in. That is not in the set of possible universes. Um, cool. So there's kind of this fun intersection here between time and computer science that I'd like to illustrate with your help. Um, I'd like you to solve this math problem using the pad of paper and pen that you got. Um, so feel free to use your neighbors, um, but please do not use any digital calculators. Um, okay, cool, so here's the first one. These are all division problems, because, cool. Oh, and when you get an answer, um, either from your paper or your friend, uh, raise your hand, and once 50% of the room has gotten an answer, we'll move on to the next one, or I've also time boxed it if these are like impossible. Okay, cool, so here's the first one. Okay, I see 50, is that 50% of the hands? That's about 50, okay, great, thank you, okay. Um, all right, now here's the next one. Um, up to three decimal places is great. Three decimal places would be five significant digits, yeah. Um. Tell your friends so if they're even start a viral quick. Uh. Okay, I see some more hands. More hands. Some more hands, great. Got a few more. Okay, that's that's roughly half. Great. Okay, thank you. Okay, great, thanks. Um, okay, now for this last one, go ahead and use your calculator. Um, so hopefully this will be a little bit faster than the last one. Ready, set, go. I have to time this, let's see. Put your hand up when you get the answer, please. This is important. Okay, cool, that looks like a lot more hands pretty quickly. Okay, cool, so what, what the fuck, Lisa, what was that? Um, <laughs> uh, oh no, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button. Um, uh, okay, 
Uh, great, uh, thank you everyone for helping us discover what the answer to these uh, number problems is approximately. Um, so, well, that really was a, uh, an illustration of is this idea called tractability. Um, so a tractable problem is one whose solution can be found within a time frame um, such that the answer makes the answer usable or actionable. Um, so it brings a solution into reach, which in turn expands the set of possible universes to include ones in which knowing that answer is suddenly accessible. Um, so basically, it takes that knowing the answer faster brings the um, set of possible universes to include universes where that answer belt is knowable. So tractability is an important feature in computer science. Um, we call conversations around tractability like runtime or express it as something called big O notation. Um, so in classic computation, basically this is counting the number of steps it will take to reach a solution to a problem as a function of the number of inputs to the problem. Um, so what you were all doing when you used a calculator to solve a division problem was an example of computational tractability. Um, so the computer did as many steps as you would have done, but it executed them in a fraction of the time. Um, so our ability to discover that answer was a lot faster than it would have been without that tool. Um, so our ability to discover solutions to problems expands the set of possible universes. And computers help, help us with this by making problems that were previously intractable, tractable. And in doing so, they change the set, what set of universes is possible. Okay, cool, so that's time. Let me figure out how to get to the thing. Okay, cool, so now we get to make a two by two um, of observability and tractability. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and do it up here, but if you guys wanna start making one on your note cards just for fun as well. Um, go ahead and do it, okay. Is that too small? Is that okay? You guys can kind of see. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Is that better? Okay. Um. Okay, cool. Oh, wait. Okay, cool. So where should I put, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put some paint in the quadrant that is our set of currently possible universes that we can end up in, or that at least we can like have some influence into where we end up. Yeah, or at least that we have some amount of kind of selection maybe possibly, um, it's gonna be here, right? So this is like the set of universes that we can play in is what's observable and what's tractable. Um, and then there's kind of this like cool thing that you can do with like, we can actually move things from not observable. Um, and we do this usually in science or like engineering by building um, tools that help us. Um, we can build tools that bring things from not observable to observable. Um, and then we can use, yeah, no, sorry. That's the wrong thing, okay. Um, and then we can make things more tractable with computers, usually. Like, and that's generally the case. 
cool. I don't actually know what else goes in these. Is this how two by twos work? Can someone help me with my three by two? Okay, um, <laughs> cool. Uh, okay, cool. So we can build a two by two that kind of shows where the play, the playground that we play in, and then how we can move things from untractable or observable into this like space. Uh, cool. Cool. Are we doing time? Are we doing okay on time? Um, cool. Okay. So the next portion of this talk is to take kind of this thread and pull on it a bit in the direction of. Um, a few different strands of how observation and time are really how this universe of selection mechanics lets us look at a variety of topics differently. And I was super ambitious and wrote out this great list of things that I would love to talk about, um, but I ran out of time, both in the preparation sense and the actual sense. Um, so since it, uh, that was a fantasy, let's just talk about fantasy. Um, okay, great. So I rolled a five. Um, so. I, uh, <laughs> I gave a short lecture on zero-knowledge proofs through a quantum rhetorical lens at the Stanford Blockchain Conference in March this year, and afterwards, someone wanted to talk to me about jumping off of buildings. Specifically, they wanted to know, since the, since the multiverse is real, wouldn't they survive if they jumped off of, a off of a building? Like, sure, they would die in a lot of the universes, but they'd end up, they would just end up continuing to exist in one of them, right? I was like, yeah, in the multiverse, I can jump off a building and survive in at least one of the multiverses. Okay, I would officially like to be the one to tell you that there is no such guarantee. Um, to really drive this point home, I've made a Venn diagram illustration. Uh, it shows the guaranteed overlap of survival from a fall from a building. Um, so one of these is where you jump off the building, and the other set is the set of universes where you live to see tomorrow. So I am not saying that it is not possible that you will survive a fall. I am saying that the existence of a multiverse is no guarantee that you will. Um, why? Well, the multiverse is limited to what is physically possible. You might jump off of a building, where it is physically impossible to survive. I'm sorry. Don't jump off buildings, okay? Like, oh, sorry, I didn't have these up. Okay, now you can see them. These are disjoint. This is my Venn diagram. Disjoint set, this is what's guaranteed by a multiverse, aka nothing, no survival is guaranteed. Um, okay, yeah, right. Um, okay, so no guarantee of survival of building jump. But what I think is really powerful about this question is that it illustrates the marvel that is the mind. Our minds can imagine a set of possible universes where you don't die when you fall off of a building. So here's a Venn diagram of the universe set that I imagined that that person had in his mind when he asked me about surviving a fall. Um, isn't that pretty great? I think it's pretty profound that humans are capable of imagining things that aren't possible. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> I think it also tells us something about gossip and online communities and our capacity to build virtual reality systems and games which have their own internal logic and interesting stuff going on. Um, these things are really interesting, but ultimately they are not reality. Just because you can imagine it or believe in it does not mean that it necessarily says anything real about our reality nor does it necessarily make it part of the set of possible universes. Um, okay, so let's play with this a bit. Let's imagine a reality that doesn't exist. Um, each of you should have received an envelope, don't open it. Um, in this envelope, there's a colored sheet of paper. So I'd like for you to imagine, um, go ahead, dream up, um, what color of paper you might have. Um, so guess, write down a color on your notepad. Okay, so I am now, I am going to show you the possible colors. Um, okay. Okay. 
Okay, so those are the possible colors. So you have one of those colors in your envelope. Um, I promise you every envelope has a piece of colored paper in it. Um, so go ahead and observe the reality that you are actually in. <laughs> okay, I'd, I'd like to leave you with the following. Um, there are a lot of possibilities of universes to choose from or that might possibly physically exist. A single photon of light itself contains trillions or more different potential locations that it could end up, and our physical reality is constantly changing. Um, like, we have this law in physics called the second law of thermodynamics about how particles are always moving and they're constantly pushing themselves toward chaos. Um, so the task of existing in a multiverse is to discover the nature of the particular universe that you and me and all of us end up in. Um, this constant movement means that the nature of our particular universe that we've ended up in presently is a constant question that we can be asking ourselves. Um, and more interestingly, who or what decides what universe that is? Is it at all changeable? Um, I'd like to hear back from you what you find out. Cool. Um, cool. Okay. Thank you for your time. I uh, hope you got something out of this exploration of reality with me. Um, I've been blogging very infrequently about, um, I'm calling it quantum rhetoric, which is expanding on this conception of the universe that we've explored here at my blog, um, foolproof.inc. Uh, you can follow it on Twitter. There's also a link for the blog. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter. I'm Nifty Nye. Um, I am curious about what you wrote down for the evidence that you would require in order to believe in the multiverse. Um, if you want to pass those back somewhere, um, that would be great. Okay, just, I guess, on front, if you want to, um, if you want to include your Twitter handle on it so I can find you online, that's great, but you can also stay anonymous. Um, cool. And then I guess, I guess we do have time for questions, depending on but I've believed this for a long time and in the multiverse. And something that helps me if I'm late or mess something up is I tell myself, you know, in another one I have this right. <laughs> yeah. So just wanted to share that. Cool. <laughs> How would I think about that? Oh gosh, that's a good question. I'm not sure, like, so I guess I'm, my, my hesitation with it is I'm not really sure what angle to approach it from. Um, Cause like clearly the dress exists in one color set or another and whether or not the representation of it in a photograph was, um, I guess like easy to tell, like the observation that the photo made about the reality, which is the color that the dress is, was ambiguous. Um, so if you kind of go back to like, was it observable or not? Um, I think the direct, obser so the observ, I, I would put that into like an observability, like question, if that makes sense. Um, person standing in front of the dress can observe it and make observations of it, multiple observations, right? Um, but with the, the photo, we didn't really have, like one, there's not, you couldn't make repeated observations. Um, you just had like the one instance. And two, you can kind of make the question as to whether or not it was an accurate observation. I don't know. <laughs> um, so uh, the, our evidence of other universes mm -hmm. is the interference that they cause with our universe. Mm -hmm. are, there, are, there, are there any other uh, you know, ideas or conjectures of other, uh, like anything else, any other kind of evidence of the other, other universes, or do we think that it is, that it is ex going to be exclusively interference that mm -hmm. tells us that those, pla that those other universes exist? Yeah, universes? no, that's a great question. Um, I think as far as physics, like physics is concerned, is what they've observed, it's only at the quantum level. Is that true? Wait, is that true? I think it's pretty much at the particle level, and it, um, at least that we know of, um, and it, it is like, yeah, it's only an interference. Yeah. Um, so the interference has, is the 
that mean that in every universe that's being created by Roman priests, then you get the same result? N no. No. So, well, okay, so with repeated, if you ran the experiment repeatedly, you would get the same result in every, yes. Mm, so, so here's what's really interesting is like so the the picture I showed you with the bands on it, that's a that's a um, we've taken so remember I said like oh we like so in science we like it used to be you set up the experiment you run the experiment you measure it you observe the result like that's it and then at some point they added this concept of run the experiment a bunch of times and aggregate the results the banded pattern that we see is the aggregation of a bunch of results. Um, you know the way that like probability works right is there's like a one in six chance that we'll get like a three if I roll the dice. Um, but if you roll the dice enough times, eventually you'll get every result, right? Um, so the, at the time that the experiment was run, um, everything that could happen happened. They just happened in different universes. Um, we only experience one. So there's only one photon. Only one photon is going to show up on that banded list in one of the places that we see. But when we repeat the experiment enough times, we see the pattern that emerges. We'll see all of the possible paths that it might that it traveled that one time that we ran it. Well, it's the same photon, but yeah, like yeah, but different photons over time. Exactly. Yeah. So is there so it's only observable at that level, there's nothing else? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like what's your perspective on decoherence in the, in terms of like how you're thinking about the many world interpretation? Yeah. Okay. So does everyone know what decoherence is? Okay. In order to understand decoherence, you have to also understand entangled particles, which we didn't talk about. Um, so uh, kind of briefly mentioned the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, I think that applies, that applies to single particles. Um, but there's also this kind of, oh, this is really interesting. Uh, OK. Um, when you have two particles at a very low level and they interact, um, they end up in something that they call superposition, which means that from our particular universe, we don't know which of those particles is in what state. And as far as we're concerned, they're both in the same state at the same time. Um, and we don't know which one is which until we have a way of observing them, if that makes sense. Um, so again, this is like observation, right? Um, if we observe, once we're able to observe what their state is, they are no longer in the superposition set. So one way, kind of like in that moment in our universe, um, there's a lot of, there's like this kind of open-ended possibility as to which one we'll end up in. It's like an equal probability that we'll end up in one where like, let's say it's two electrons and they collide with each other in such a way that they become entangled and one of them has spin, one of them will spin left and one of them will spin right. We just don't know which one is going to spin which direction when. Um, so decoherence in this, um, Decoherence basically is when um, an observation happens on the particles such that you know which of the possible universes you ended up in. Um, so decoherence is any amount of like um, uh, interaction with that kind of like self-contained state such that um, the knowledge of, such that it's suddenly observable to see where you ended up. That makes sense. Does that answer your question? Okay. 
Yeah. Oh, so and Feynman's QED, he's got a great he does so he does um he has this great like graph of um like here's what happens when we send two particles through a slit and the probability that they reach the back when there's a sensor on both slits um is exactly two percent. If you remove the um if you remove the, the if you remove both the both of the what do you call it um, sensors from the slits, suddenly it's anywhere you you enter a probability set, and that the probability that the um, the light will reach it ranges from zero to four percent because now we're in this like probability possibility it could happen. Um, and but if you have only one sensor or if you have a faulty sensor, all of a sudden the um, the the resulting like probability set of whether or not the photon will reach the um, the thing behind it um, becomes like this function between the zero to four and the two. So he's got these like kind of cool um, like graphs you can actually draw of how um, like varying observation like actually does impact what we like, see or like yeah. Yeah, QED is great. You should read it if you haven't. It's like it's a good book. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. I think there are some disturbing implications of this theory. For example, um, if I uh, wanted to create a world, well, I, I, I heard like stories of people, they, they say their dog is poisoned. Someone poisoned their dog. It might just be a common paranoia mm. or it might be something that happens more commonly. If for whatever reason I wanted to get back at someone, I could have a more, a greater chance, according to your model, of having their dog happenstance be poisoned if I built up a alternate identity as the dog poisoner. And then I roll the dice, and if it was 50%, I would convince myself to forget that I ever thought of that. Mm. And then that would be the other one. Y so, um, yeah, yeah, sorry. Well, oh. yeah, two other examples of, of how it could be disturbing. So, like, what happened to the other, like, five versions of me that drew the other colors of cards? Oh, the other, I'm sorry? The, the other five versions of me that drew the other five colors of cards out of the envelope? What did you do with them? What do you mean? What did I do in with the them? Other, in the other universes, did you, like this, or, or when we were writing down the random number? And oh. then it wasn't the same as your number. What did you do with the other ones? <laughs> the so I think that um, I think that kind of wait oh wait and it's easy to see, like so. First of all, the interactions that we see with the other universes only ever happen on a quantum level. So the experiments that we ran today um, were like fairly deterministic. If that makes sense, like. Um, Yes, there's possibly other universes. There's like a lot of other ways that it might have had, ended up with probability. Um, but yeah, like the way that you like figure out, like yeah. I, I guess I'm trying to say that like I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, me neither. Yeah, yeah. But it, but it makes I see it makes more sense at the lower level with finer. Yeah. 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 So like, I mean, so it's like maybe, so like, oh, I guess like my point is at some point we don't know what the possible universe set is beyond, like, so the construction of what was physically possible in terms of how I handed out the cards, mm -hmm. I don't know how much variance I had in that, right? So maybe the only world that actually, like, multiverse exists, but maybe the one that, like, the one that we ended up in is the only one that's physically possible. Yeah, that, that actually sense. reminded me of my third example. So um, <laughs> the... I mean, we're done, we're done with questions, sorry. Uh, okay. Well, let me just say, the, pair, the science, um, having the statistic statistics added could increase the intensity of paradigms and paradigm shifts, because something is observing us. Maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, Lisa. Um, OK, we're going to start uh, a couple lightning talks, and then we'll have the last keynote after that. Uh, so yeah, please take a seat. And uh, welcome, Schnell. Um And if Howe is here, please um, come up front. Thank you.